Have you heard about this new study with microbats? Isn't this... Oh, that, that was my wine glass going down, everybody. Sorry about that. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. A study that's been done up on Givaganya. Yes. So they did this... It was a clever little study where they basically tried to find out how many microbats there were flying around in a certain area. And they chose two distinct areas. One was where there had been just a cultural burn, so a... A, a cooler, lower kind of a burn with less less impact on the canopy. And the other was uh, just a conventional hazard reduction burn. And they wanted to see if it had made a difference to the microbats about where they were basically living. And there was a big difference. But what was also rather impressive was up there on Mount Gibbogunya, there are 13 species of microbats. Yeah. To our knowledge, this was the first time that any survey of microbats had been done Mm. up there. So that was really impressive. Yeah. Microbats are like flying foxes, but they aren't exactly the same. The flying foxes, of course, are a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. And the flying foxes eat different food. Mm. So the flying foxes are fruit and blossom eaters and the microbats find their food in the air and they do it by echolocation. Mm. And they take they're, they're carnivores mostly. They take, you know, flying beetles and, and yeah. moths and that sort of thing. So it's a big big difference. Mm. But mm. same basic Body construction, and that body construction is obviously extremely successful because it hasn't changed in 50 million years. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Yeah. And so what they've done, what evolution has done with them is their hands have now turned into wings, Mm -hmm. and that has been extremely successful. The back legs have all but disappeared. They're still there with Mm -hmm. some claws or toes on the end of them. And basically the pelvis is much reduced, but they're the basic mammal design that we all have, you and me and everybody in the mammal department. So how they evolved like that, to take out the flying animals at night, because they're nocturnal, has obviously been a very successful evolutionary story. Mm. But, you know, I did not expect 13 species at Gibbogunia. No, I don't think anybody did. No way did I think so. And even added to that, four of them are vulnerable species. Yeah. So, yes. so that shows it has high environmental value, that, that mountain. That little patch. Yeah. I like to call it a mountain, but of course it doesn't quite get <laughs> But it's high. I don't know if you walk on it, it seems to be to me. It feels like a mountain when you're going up it. And so these warm-blooded animals that, basically are covered in hair and feed their young through milk, are living there and some obviously like some areas better than others. So the highest species counts were found in the cultural burn areas. Mm. And we think that the reason maybe for that is the way they roost. They, They roost in mines and culverts, safe little places, maybe even behind in rocks Mm, gathered together mm. but also in just the bark of trees they're so small Mm, mm. that they can just sort of get in tightly underneath yes Mm. but with the big burns with our conventional sort of burns we tend to destroy the top of the trees Mm. like the stags Mm. the stags are those Branches that just stick out, that look really ugly at the top of the canopy of the tree, but they can be habitat. Mm. And so when there's a big hot burn, they often drop. If they don't drop at the time, they will drop later to the floor of the forest or woodland, mm. thereby losing nest sites mm. for the microbats. Mm. So it's significant, I think, that the cultural burns basically win out for biodiversity in this particular case. Mm. What I also found very interesting was there weren't that many species to be found in the gullies. No, it's it's said in the report that that's not an attractive area for them anyway. I know, but they, why? 
I didn't I, say why. It seemed to imply because of the dampness. Yeah. Yes. Well, are they not flying things in damp areas? I don't know I the about answer. navigation. I mean, they are too. often around creeks and things. We're hoping to do some interviews of Max from Lodge Environmental who did this survey. So we'll know some more about that in another week or two. But first of all, I just want to clarify for people because I know I used to get mixed up between what's Mount Gibraltar, what's Skibagunya, what's the jib and so on. So Gibagunya is a patch of land that goes from the back of the golf course out on Centennial Road and it goes right over to the old Hume Highway at Welby. Mm. It's quite steep to access from either side. You can get onto it from either side. It's 185 hectares. And to be honest, although I've walked up there quite a bit, I didn't really think it was as a particularly special little spot. But since this survey has been done, I've done a bit of research and I've learned that some species that have been recorded up there have included the powerful owl, greater gliders. We'd actually heard that there were mm, greater gliders yes, up there. And yellow-bellied gliders are expected to be up there. And apparently koalas have been recorded up there. Well, I don't know how recently. Well, it doesn't surprise me given how many koalas we actually have got. Yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting patch because it doesn't join up with any other little patch of bush. It's just there by itself. And so there are risks of the population interbreeding and so on. So it's going to be interesting to see how this area gets managed over time. Yes. We, my, my, my fantasy is, well, maybe it can become a reality, is a wildlife corridor that links the jib. Mm-hmm. Alexandra mm. and Gibbagunya. Yeah. Well, then now, when you look cut. at it on the map, you can see that in the middle is Barrel, Mittagong, and not quite Mossvale, but mm. definitely those two big urban mm. areas. Mm. But we've got all these animals just there on these islands mm. breeding with one another, and they could be wiped out with one genetic disease just so easily we would lose the lot. Mm. So if we don't join them up, and make it a big corridor that they can mix genetically, mm. you know, the future might There's, be quite bleak. That's right. That's mm. right. So it's an interesting patch to watch and richer than I had expected. And another aspect of it is that it's got all different vegetation types up there. Because it's quite hilly up and down, there are some deep, deep valleys with really moist vegetation as Lou said but there are also some much drier spots at the top and there are quite a few rocks up there so they are probably providing habitat for the microbats uh, and one of the interesting things I read in the survey was that they recommend that regardless of the type of burn they don't burn any closer than 25 meters to any of the rocky outcrops. Yes I was struck by that too and I hadn't thought so much about how you know you get a bunch of rocks they make a bunch of cracks mm. don't they? Mm. Yeah nice so spot. it will be and uh, uh, another thing I should just mention about microbats is they do actually hibernate in cold weather. Yes. Which is quite unusual. Um, it's a way of lowering their body temperature and reducing their metabolic rate, and thereby they're not using the fat reserves that they've built up when things mm. are good. Very clever. Yeah. So yeah. They, they would need places to hide for that. Throughout that period. Yeah, mm. that's right. And as Lou says, they eat a lot of insects. They apparently eat something like 40% of their body weight each day in insects. So they're actually providing a significant service, particularly in agricultural areas Absolutely, and things. That's They're so an true. important animal. We need to be looking after them. Yeah, yeah, they take a lot of pests out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we like microbats. I heard recently a story of somebody who picked up his raincoat from the back veranda and inside there was a microbat. Mm -hmm. So we've provided him with two little microbat nesting boxes for them to move into. Instead of his raincoat. Instead of his raincoat. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so over the next few weeks or months, we hope to hear a little bit more about this study and the implications of it.